Newt the ferret died yesterday after a short, tragic battle with insulinoma. I'd like to take this opportunity to honor the life Newt led so that other ferret owners can see, or rather know, that their ferrets' lives have deep meaning as well. I'll be honest about how Newt's unfortunate illness consumed him and eventually led to his death. Then I'd like to describe to you what heaven might look like to a ferret and tell you what questions Newt's death raised about my own life and its inherent brevity. This without a doubt goes beyond the scope of what is expected on a page like The Modern Ferret. But I can tell you with complete confidence that I feel called to speak these words. Celebrating Newt's life. I met Newt when he was eight months old. He was living in a garage with his brother Albert, and at the time, we actually considered taking Newt and leaving Albert. But we quickly reconsidered and brought both boys home with us to join our family that day. When they came to us, Albert was actually named Mr. Bigglesworth, and Newt was called Yayo. Newt got his new name the same day he arrived home. As soon as we let him out of the carrier, Newt bounded towards our balcony door, climbed up our balcony railing, jumped, and plunged three stories below. It was terrifying, but luckily he landed on a grass patch and lived to tell the tale. It was after that moment our roommate at the time and dear friend said, you ought to name him Isaac Newton because I think he just successfully discovered the law of gravity. And so he was named. All his life, Newt was curious. Curious as a matter of principle, and also curious in the peculiar ways Newt chose to live his life. Let me explain. Newt's highest calling was pursuit of the truth, or curiosity. There was not a single door in our house that Newt was not hell-bent on figuring out what was behind it. However, once he learned what was behind something, or inside of it, Newt spent little time actually pursuing what was on the other side. It was the act of opening the door to the unknown that mattered most, not the exploration thereafter. And that was always really funny to watch. It reminded me of this song by Miley Cyrus called It's the Climb, because to Newt, there was always going to be another mountain. Newt was both the healthiest ferret and the unhealthiest ferret we have ever known. If given the chance, Newt would gladly jump face deep into a bag of tortilla chips. And if you weren't careful, he'd eat his body weight in highly processed carbs. Although we do not recommend feeding your ferret chips of any kind. On the other hand, Newt was also the most willing of our three ferrets to convert to a raw meat diet. He took to it pretty much immediately and with such enthusiasm it's like he was saying, what took you guys so long to give me the good stuff? I'd venture to guess that if you asked Newt what he thought a ferret's diet ought to consist of, he'd tell you 50% raw meat and organs, 40% tortilla chips, 8% popcorn left on the floor, and 2% coconut oil licked off of mom's reluctant legs. Newt hated all ferrets except his brothers and the occasional female at our ferret meetup parties. This is kind of surprising because the ferrets he didn't know treated him much better than his brother Albert did, who humped him constantly. Newt loved to dig up potted plants around the house. When he got caught in the act, he showed no remorse whatsoever, which is very different than moose. He became filthy after digging up potted plants, so we'd give him a bath, but that was all good and fine because Newt was the kind of ferret who loved a good soak. And perhaps that was why he got himself all dirty in the first place. Newt took what he was given in this life and he made it his own. If he felt a certain aspect of his life was being underutilized, he'd make changes to remedy it. Case in point, one day Newt noticed that a stack of freshly laundered dish towels were going to waste. Just sitting there being clean. So he dragged them one by one into his favorite kitchen cabinet and made a nest for him and his brothers. No one could say that Newt wasn't resourceful. 
Newt's Battle with Illness. Newt had his first seizure at the end of April of 2020. I feel immense guilt that we didn't catch the progression of the insulinoma sooner, before the seizure started. Before that first terrifying night, where Newt began staggering and foaming at the mouth, he exhibited other signs that now seem obvious in retrospect. During the months prior to Newt's first seizure, he became extremely lethargic. Healthy ferrets sleep a lot, but it seems that unhealthy ferrets prefer to do nothing else but sleep. So I feel like we should have known. As the illness progressed, we worked with a wonderful vet to tailor his medication and minimize his discomfort. However, it was really hard to come to terms with the fact that the medication would not cure the insulinoma or even halt its progress. Newt was living on borrowed time and his quality of life continued to deteriorate. When I asked others online how life usually ended for a ferret with insulinoma, they said, with a series of endless seizures accompanied by screaming. That's something you'd rather put out of your mind until it comes knocking at your door, which is exactly what we did. The day before Newt died, we took him and his brothers to a family farm and they played in the leaves. Well, Newt didn't really play, but he did wobble through the plants and then he was able to be held tightly by Channing as he fell back asleep. We heard Newt scream for the first time on the car ride home that night. His body thrashed next to his brothers in the carrier and he let out a noise I will never forget. We got home around midnight and Channing sat with Newt and his brothers in our bathroom for the next five hours, holding space for Newt as he screamed and thrashed. Channing tried every remedy we had been taught by our team of vets and nothing would bring him back. Newt had not been himself for many months and I believe I had said goodbye to him in a lot of ways before that night. Channing, on the other hand, was heartbroken at the prospect of losing Newt despite having the will and determination to save him. That's a hard realization to come to terms with, isn't it? Seeing something that doesn't seem right, witnessing immense suffering, signing up with everything inside you to make it right, and realizing that that still will not make it so. At around 5 a.m., I entered our bathroom and sat myself on the linoleum floor next to Channing, who was holding our little nudie guy inside a blanket and crying. I told Channing Newt was gone. He had been for quite some time, and we needed to let him go so he could let go of this life and journey on to the next one. We brought Newt to the emergency vet clinic at 6 a.m. The hospital staff took us to a special room with a big, comfy gray couch, soft lighting, and absolutely no examination equipment. That's because it wasn't a room to determine if an animal like Newt still stood a chance. It was just a space to say goodbye. They injected Newt with a substance to help him drift off into a forever sleep, which Channing said must be the ultimate dream for any ferret. We held Newt between us, supported by our four hands, as we told him how much fun he was going to have in heaven and how much we'd enjoyed our short time together. Then we sang to Newt in broken, raspy voices, a song we often sing about our three ferrets and where they like to hide our socks. Newt's little heart held on longer than the hospital staff anticipated, but that didn't surprise me or Channing as our little Nudie has always been an obstinate little man. And maybe it's because even though we thought we were holding on to Newt to give him a proper goodbye, he was on the other side holding on to us to make sure we had enough time to say goodbye. Because Newt was always thoughtful like that. We put Newt in the ground two days later, wrapped in an old dish towel, surrounded by flowers sent to us by an anonymous person, and fallen leaves from the rubber tree that he loved to terrorize during his waking life. We also placed a couple tortilla chips in his hands in case he got hungry on his way up to heaven. 
Newt's favorite place in the backyard was by our neighbor's fence, where underneath a family of voles nested. Before Newt became sick and weak, he spent a majority of his free time in the garden digging rigorously to get to them. Today, Newt is buried next to that same area on the fence. A vision of heaven for Newt the ferret. I believe in heaven. I may not have a year or two ago, but certain events have transpired that have transformed my faith and called me to look beyond this life, or at least life as we understand it to be. This belief has brought me great joy, picturing the eternal life Newt has found up above. I've watched videos and read stories of people who've died for seconds or minutes, and I've found great solace in what they see. A lot of times, they'll see their childhood dog eagerly awaiting their arrival, only to pounce on their owner and cover them in wet kisses as they arrive. I can only hope I'll see Nudie again in such a fashion. I can see Nudie exploring endless fields of long grass, full of complex tunnel systems and exciting new smells. It's always that perfect time just before dawn, so the light is easy on Newt's little eyes. There's an endless supply of doors and fences for Newt to wiggle his way into and underneath, and each new discovery leads to a better one than the last. In heaven, Newt is both completely rested and happy to take a nap any chance he gets. There's nothing to be afraid of up there. And when he gets the urge to scale another three-story tall building and jump, instead of plunging to the ground, Newt will fly up and away and on to his next adventure. How lucky we are to know these incredible creatures and how lucky we would all be to meet them again in another life. The meaning of a life so small and so short. To anybody listening to this that has never known a ferret or perhaps a pet in general, it may be hard to imagine projecting so much meaning onto a life such as Newt's, one that is so short and so small. But I challenge you to consider this. If deriving so much meaning from such a little creature seems trivial, what is worthy of meaning in this life? Where is the cutoff between a life or experience worthy of meaning and deep contemplation and that which is simply not enough? I'll ask you to consider this as well. If you cannot derive meaning from something so little as a life such as a ferret named Newt, what hope do you have to derive meaning from something much bigger? Are you perhaps looking for a way to avoid meaning in your life? And what possible good could come from that? If any of this seems to be too much, I get it, but that's really too bad. It's too bad to live a life denying that inherent gut feeling that there may be more meaning to this life in places that we are told that there is none. Thoughts on my own life. It's quite impossible to feel a loss so deeply and not contemplate one's own life. If Newt's life was brief at just four years old, are our lives any less brief compared to eternity? If I can say that Newt's purpose in life was to pursue truth through curiosity, as well as bring joy to those around him and around the world, what can I possibly say about my own life's purpose? Can it be answered so easily? And is it for me to say, or is it for others to tell me? If given the ability, could Newt have told me his true purpose in life? Would it have even been his to say? I watched a video recently about a man who died and went to heaven. This may be difficult for those of you that are not religious, and I understand that, and I want to hold space for your well-warranted doubts. However, I believe the story in this video is powerful. Whether you believe it to be evidence of something that transcends this life, or that it's merely a misfiring of neurons in the brain during a traumatic physiological event. In this video, the man describes dying for 30 seconds from a heart attack, and in that time he walked in the village of heaven. Angel spoke to him and told him that God had given him a very specific task and that he must go back to earth and complete it. And in the video, he said that yes, some people fear dying, others fear eternity, but he can tell you a much scarier fate 
is not living the life you were put on this earth to do. To a religious person, this may feel like a call from God to do something in particular. To a non-religious person, this may feel like intuition or that gut feeling of a pursuit that you just must follow. After watching this video, I asked myself, what in this crazy world that seems to get crazier by the minute am I supposed to do? I can't fix what I view as wrong in this world. I can't even say with certainty that my judgment of what I think is wrong in this world is inherently correct. I just know that there's suffering, corruption, and evil in ways that have genuinely warranted somewhat of an existential crisis on my part. So what can I do? Well, the man in this video who I truly believe visited heaven told me to look inside myself and acknowledge what I was put on this earth to do. How could anybody identify that? Well, he said, you can tell by that pull you get to a certain interest or a vocation that you can't quite explain. For me, this has always been animals. Ever since I was a baby, I've been called to their side by a force stronger than anything I can fight. And believe me, I've tried. My mom said she saw my connection to animals since I was a baby, with the books I gravitated towards and then the pets I cared for. She said, animals felt called to me and I felt called to them like a magnet. And I have a feeling a lot of you can relate. Beyond pets I kept at home, I've always felt a special calling to animals in the wild. If there's a snake in a bush, I can hear it in a way I can't explain. And in the blink of an eye, I'm holding that snake in my arms, unable to articulate any of the moments just before. It's spiritual. If there's an animal that's tense or afraid, I'm called to slow my breath and connect to them in a way that I can't describe using our five senses. I can try my best to tell you what animals mean to me in an analogy that came to me the other night. Imagine jumping into a large body of water and holding onto your breath as you swim around underneath the surface. At first, holding your breath is not so bad. There's plenty of oxygen from the last moment you were above the surface, breathing deeply. As time goes on, you spend more time underwater and your chest tightens. Oxygen is slowly running out. You don't belong down there. As much as you'd like to, you can't stay, not without access to more oxygen. Just a little bit longer, you think. I can hold on a little bit longer. You try to stretch out that one breath you've been holding on to since you first plunged underwater. Because the world is so fascinating under here, under the surface. It's so different. You can't stop exploring. Your chest continues to tighten as the oxygen levels go down in your body. And signals start firing saying, get back to the surface immediately or else. From the depths of this large body of water, you orient yourself to emerge from the surface at the last possible moment, gasping for air. <sighs> you are safe. You made it just in time. You can breathe deeply once again. Animals to me are like breathing. When I see them all the time, it's like breathing deeply and slowly. Business as usual, life above the surface. But when I go too long without, it's like I've spent too long under the surface and I'm struggling for air. After long enough, the first sight of an animal elicits a feeling like gasping for air after wondering if I'd ever breathe again. So then I can at least say that. I can at least say I'm called to share space with animals. I cannot say what purpose it serves, but I know with certainty I am meant to exist with them and not without. The next calling I feel is to write and to share that writing when it doesn't just feel like letters on the page anymore, but those same gasps for air. That without the certain kind of writing and a certain level of sharing, I'd have an awfully hard time with this life. And that is where I'm finding meaning these days. I know I'm looking for more meaning in my life lately. And I shared all this because I think you might be too. I hope this story made you feel something because sometimes I feel like even though the internet is full of knowledge, it really lacks wisdom. 
The internet may answer so many questions, but it doesn't ever seem to ask any bigger ones in its place. And so I wrote this piece because Newt deserves to be honored, yes, even though his life may have been so very short and so very small. And your life, for the exact same reasons, deserves to be honored as well. <laughs>